Hi everyone, I'm Sean, and welcome back to another installment of The 101. So in this episode, we're going to continue talking about different malware types. And today, we're going to talk about probably the most dangerous type out there, fruitkits. Now I know, that's a bold statement, especially when certain types of malware that we've already discussed have infected millions of machines worldwide and caused billions of dollars in damages. And so to understand why, today we ask, what makes a rootkit so dangerous? So a few episodes back, we quickly defined rootkits, stating that rootkits are designed to dig deep in order to gain administrative access, either by attacking known vulnerabilities that enable privilege escalation, or by tricking an unsuspecting victim into giving it up. But today, we're going to expand that definition, because getting root access is just the beginning of what a rootkit is designed to do. Rootkits are dangerous because they obtain administrator, or root access, in order to modify the victim machine so it can persist without detection. These modifications include, but are not limited to, establishing a secure backdoor for remote access, changing system configurations to hide its activities, and altering endpoint protection software to ignore its presence. So as we started to talk about last week, modern malware types are not as black and white as we might think. In reality, these different types of malware are more like building blocks, or as we've stated before, modules, which can be combined together to achieve certain objectives. And rootkits are a perfect example of this. They often don't stand alone as the attack, but they definitely play a role in the overall attack. And the role that rootkits play is nasty, because they have the ability to take total control of the endpoint, all the way down to the kernel in some cases, to do whatever they please. Okay, so there are a couple different types of rootkits. User-level rootkits work on top of the operating system and basically run as an administrator. With that power, they can do all sorts of things, like change system configurations, hide processes, and even interact with and modify files and programs. Though they're really good at hiding themselves, they can be detected by savvy endpoint protection platforms. And that just won't stand. So kernel level rootkits go a step further, infecting at the same level as the operating system. Now, while this aids in their evasion from security programs, which run on top of the operating system, it can lead to instability on the machine as a whole, which may give its presence away. But it doesn't stop there. Firmware level rootkits place a permanent malware image on hardware be it network cards, hard drives, networking equipment, even system BIOS. And virtual level rootkits, which infect a hypervisor of a virtual environment, well, they're more proof of concept than real world threat today, but their eventuality is a chilling prospect for security folks everywhere. Now, it's important to note that the level of control that rootkits have makes their evasion techniques unique relative to other types of malware. Malware's pretty good at masking itself, whether it's changing its extension or packing its code, but rootkits? They don't have to mask themselves from the scanners or analyses of these endpoint protection platforms. They literally rewrite their instructions to not do those things. Now, there are some techniques out there to discover a suspected rootkit. For example, you could boot a suspected infection from an alternative trusted medium like a USB or CD-ROM in order to see the rootkit while it can't actively hide itself. And you can also monitor for abnormal system and network behavior. But these techniques are labor intensive. They require a keen watchful eye and unfortunately are not well suited for the average user. Okay, so what did we learn today? Rootkits are so dangerous because of their ability to obtain the highest privileges possible in order to modify the machine that they infect. In doing so, they can literally tell endpoint defenses like traditional AV to not look for them, while also masking their activities from watchful human eyes. It's this set of actions that have made rootkits a cornerstone in modern malware use. And it's often why they're used in larger coordinated attacks to persist in a network once a foothold has been established. And it's another reason why investments in NJV, which can pick out the nuanced behaviors of a rootkit, are so important today. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thanks for watching, and join us next week as we continue to answer endpoint security one question at a time. Now, as always, if you have questions, we want to hear about them. You should tweet us at carbonblack underscore inc and use the hashtag the101. Or you can email us at the101 at carbonblack.com. I'm Sean. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.